Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church this morning and our opportunity to worship together. Uh, thank you for your patience in uh, working through the, you know, technology. It just kind of does what it does when it needs to. So a couple announcements. I would draw your attention to your bulletin. Uh, there is going to be another Dog Days barbecue at the end of this month on July 24th, and there is a sign-up sheet out there on the table, so we encourage you to do that and encourage you to be here. I had to miss the last one because I was at Covenant Church um, celebrating with them their 40th anniversary, but I heard it was an awesome success here, and I look forward to being at the next one. Also wanted to, again, draw your attention to July 13th. We will be meeting here at the church. Jackie will lead us in doing some beading crafts for our Samaritan's Purse boxes. And if you haven't had a chance to be here and help out with those, it's really been a lot of fun. I missed the first one, but I got to do the second one. We made sewing kits. I can't remember how many we made, but it's awesome, and we'll be able to do some shopping to put those things in our boxes uh, coming up, I think, in October or November. Uh, also, the yard sale. Lots of stuff is being brought in. Thank you, thank you so much. We're looking forward to having a big sale again this fall. And uh, you can come on Monday mornings from 9 to 12. Uh, this Thursday, Nikki and I will be here from 9 to 12. If you need some help unloading things and would like some help with that, that would be great. Uh, if you could come earlier in the morning, that'd be awesome. If we don't have to do it when it's 100 degrees, that would be wonderful. And you'll notice that I am not Megan or Tyson. Uh, they are out for a couple of weeks. The dates are in your bulletin. And then Elizabeth, our admin assistant, is also going to be out uh, beginning this Wednesday. But there are some wonderful volunteers that are going to be in the church office. So if you need anything... Call the church office. We'll have that taken care of. Any pastoral care needs, I'm happy to take care of, or uh, Pastor Jeff is also. So please let us know if you need anything during that time. All right. Now is the time to get up and say hi to your neighbor or meet somebody new. All righty, if we could gather back into our seats. If we could gather back together to begin our time of worship together. Let us do the call to worship. I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me. For who is God except the Lord? Who but our God is a solid rock? The Lord lives. Praise to my rock. May the God of my salvation be exalted. Let us pray. Dear gracious God, a drop of water, insignificant in isolation. When dropped in a pool, the ripples move out into infinity. The water is changed by one drop of water. A drop is falling now into the pool of our spirit. The water begins to ripple. Holy God, as we consider the magnitude of a drop of water to touch and change the pool, may we hear the power of your touch in our lives, the potential for our lives to touch others. Amen. Happy Sunday, everybody. It's great to have you here for this morning. Why don't you stand and join us for our first song of praise. Mm 
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence. I've tasted of the sweetest of us when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit Holy Spirit you are well That will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I tasted and seen of the sweet. My shame is undone in your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the Whoa. 
this is the time in our service where we have an invitation to confession. Every week as we worship together, we have the opportunity to admit to ourselves, to each other, and to God that we do not always live as we are called. In this time of confession, this time of opening our hearts, let us remember that God is merciful and just, eager to offer grace and love. Let us pray first in our union prayer of confession and then on our own in a time of silence. Pray with me. Gracious and loving God, open our hearts so that we are able to admit to you the fullness of our lives, that which is beautiful and good and that which is hurtful and hateful. We confess that we do not follow Jesus in all that we do. We love with condition, we judge and condemn. We cast the first stone and keep the logs in our own eyes. We do not turn to you as a source of our healing. Forgive us, we pray. Forgive our sin and empower us to be the imitators of Christ in love and service. Amen. This is a time for silent confession. Amen. Hear this assurance of forgiveness. Friends, in Christ know this. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. Let us remember this surpassing grace. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Please stand for our next song. <clears throat> I woke, woke up in the darkness, darkness surrounded by silence. So oh, where, where have I gone? I woke to reality, losing its grip on me. Oh, where, where have I gone? Because I can see the light. For I see the sunrise. You called and you shouted, broke through my deafness. Now I'm breathing in, breathing out. I'm alive again. You shattered my darkness, washed away. For me, I searched for you. What took me so long? I was looking outside as if love would ever want to hide. I'm finding I was wrong. Cause I can feel the wind before it hits my you called and you shouted, broke through my deafness, now I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out, I'm alive again, you shattered my darkness, you washed away my blindness, now I'm breathing I'm alive again Cause I want you Yes 
I want you, I need you, and I'll do whatever I have to just to get through. Cause I love you, yeah, I love you. You called and you shouted and broke through. on up to the front for our time together. Let's come over to this side this morning, over here. Sit up on the highest step. Anybody else? Anybody who would like to be a child again? You're welcome. Come, yeah, come on up. <laughs> Okay, I've asked Baylor to share with us something that he made out of Legos. Any of you like to do Legos? Anybody else? I know Baylor loves to do Legos. Baylor, what do you have here? You want to take it out of the box for us? And set it right, set it right up there. Set it right on there. Ah, oh. you have other pieces in here too? You want to take out? What is, what is this, Baylor? It's an elf house. It's a what? Elf house. An elf house. Anybody ready for Christmas? <laughs> We're getting there. Do you have some elves too? Oh, there's, there's Santa's sled. Here come some elves. Oh, I see a couple of pancakes are high. Oh. Okay. So, about. You, you like to build lots of Lego things, don't you? Yeah. Do you remember about how many pieces are in this? How many different Legos? About? More than 100. Is that being heard? I can't tell. Yeah, okay. More than 100. And about how many pages of instructions were there for this? Five. Do you remember? No? We talked last night. You thought maybe there was 100 pages. I don't know, but there's a lot of tiny, tiny little pieces, and they, they all have to fit together, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Each have their own, own place? Yes. Okay. Well, how, how would it work if you were building this and you, you found that there was a Lego missing. You didn't have one. Would that be a problem? No. No. Oh, wrong answer. <laughs> yeah. You could build it anyway? Yeah. yeah. But what if it was a piece that something else was connected to and now you couldn't finish it? Would that be a problem? I could just find a separate Lego in my, all my Lego bench. <laughs> You would find another piece. Well, we've got hundreds of pieces. Why don't you, can you turn it around and show them the back side? This thing has a light to it, too. I wouldn't have the patience for this, but he'll sit at his table, paging through that instruction manual, putting all these little things together. So this is the back side, and can you turn the light on? Ah, Okay. And, and what is this thing that looks like a chimney? What does that actually do? It makes a pan nice and loud. It makes a pancake. It makes pancakes. <laughs> Anybody want a chimney that makes pancakes? I love it. Okay. Thank you, Baylor. Well, that takes a lot of work to put all those pieces together. You can have a seat now if you want. I have a question for all of you. Why don't you stand up right where you are, stand up a minute, and look out over this group of people here. What do you see? 
Tell me what, whatever it is you think about when you see that. What it is you see? Any? What? People. People, right? People. Yep. Lots of people, and of course, there's other things, right? You know what? When God looks at this group, you know what He sees, and I don't think you'll be able to guess the answer. Greatness. What? Greatness. Oh, that's cool, Noah. God sees greatness, he does. And I think that really kind of connects to what I was going to say, because when God looks at this, he doesn't see just individual people. He does. He sees each one of us, and he knows us personally, exactly who we are. But God sees something bigger, and it's a little bit like a Lego project made up of all little pieces. The Bible says God looks at this, and he sees, get this, a holy temple. Living, each one of us is like a stone that helps to make up the temple. And we're going to have a Bible lesson today that talks about that. But the Bible calls us living stones. And when God looks at this group of people, he sees a holy temple, a place. When we come together, God sees a place where he lives and where he is worshipped and also as a holy temple that other people can look at, like he looks at your lives and he looks at their lives and he looks at our life together, and he sees a place where other people who don't know God can come to know God by knowing you because you know God and knowing you and you know God. And other people look at us and they see what God's like. They're supposed to be able to see that. They don't always, but that's, that's the idea. So God looks at this, he looks at us, and we're a holy temple. And he's put all of the pieces together. The Bible says he's building a holy temple made up of people who believe in him. Isn't that cool? That's cool. So now, on Sundays when you come and you meet people here at church, you know them as individuals, but you can think, oh, there's one of God's living stones. How cool is that? And you get to be a living stone. And we get to be a living stone. That's really cool. All right? Let's pray and ask God to help us to do that. Gracious God, thank you for shaping us and calling us together. Thank you for giving us our personal, individual life. We are a unique being. Nobody else like us. But we are also called to come together as your people, as living stones to to be that place where you are worshipped and where your presence is known and felt. Help us to be the kind of people that when others see how we behave, they see something of what you are like, God. Thank you for giving us that responsibility and help us to do it well. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you. You can either go to uh, sit back with your family or to nursery. Dave Roper... He's going to bring us our, there he is, our minute for mission this morning. Probably minutes for mission. You get more than a minute, I think, right? <laughs> I think I get a little more. Good. I hope I get Testing, testing, testing. Yes. Can you hear me? No. Uh, yes. Okay. The thing I love about Legos is if you go to the Lego store as a grandparent and you're wanting to purchase the parts, why um, there's various prices, but the people, those little tiny pieces that are the people, those are really expensive. So <laughs> people are valuable in God's kingdom. So, well, mission moment, and we'll see if they've got slides going here. <coughs> We had a little technical difficulty this morning. I <laughs> still are having technical difficulties. Well, I, I can just talk. Uh, I'm kind of boring by myself, but uh, <laughs> you guys want to just uh, not worry about it this morning? Why, well, I'll go ahead and, and tell you what we have to say. Uh, Jesus told his disciples to go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. It says that in a couple of places in Scripture. 
uh, Monument Presbyterian in keeping with uh, the sent in his name, part of our mission statement. Uh, we're giving our support to international ministries which both preach the love of Jesus and in practical ways they show that love of Jesus as well. Uh, our mission minutes this morning is designed to highlight two of our international <coughs> missionaries, Bless the Nations, uh, which is uh, Stephen Kathy Manning, and most of you are pretty familiar with that. They've been supported long-term by the church. Uh, they specialize in redeeming out of slavery people uh, both in India and Pakistan. Uh, th they may not technically be slaves always, but they're so uh, economically beholden to their bosses that they really have no means of escape. Uh, brick kiln workers and sometimes cattle operations, the people who work there, it's sort of like uh, that uh, 16 tons and what do you get? You know, uh, I owe my soul to the company store. These people are literally in economic bondage to, the, uh, to those who are their overseers. So Stephen Kathy Manning and uh, their, their brick kiln operation is one of those uh, operations that we support. Um, being freed from slavery though, is not just a one-time, one-and-done type of thing. Those people who are freed from slavery have had only one usually very uh, kind of uh, drudgery-inducing type of uh, life, like in the brick kiln. This is not exciting work. And it doesn't prepare them for uh, other work outside of that. So once they're freed, Steve and Kathy, they, they actually get a deed showing their, their freedom from slavery. And it... it has a date on it showing when they were freed. And uh, Steve and Kathy have already begun to work with them to provide some alternative means for them to make a living. So uh, the slide that you don't see <laughs> shows uh, a vegetable cart, which was put together for uh, uh, this family that was redeemed. And it's just a bicycle with a really big rack on the back of it. And they can carry fruit and vegetables on that bicycle and sell from the bicycle. So it's just an alternative way of, of making a living that does not cause them to be indebted to or constantly in economic bondage to their, their masters. Uh, another need that's a part of that ministry, well, I guess you could call it a need. Why are these people in bondage, uh, in this economic bondage in the first place? Some of it's uh, just inability for they and their families to reach out, get outside of the situations that they're in. So uh, that's a multi-generational thing. It isn't just one generation that gets trapped in this cycle. The, the children often end up following in the footsteps of their parents. So uh, Steve and Kathy are supporting Mrs. Pastor Chand in Pakistan, uh, a ministry that is actually school, it's teaching, education for these families that are uh, both the ones that are freed from bondage and the ones that are potentially going to be freed from bondage. So. Uh, there's uh, quite a bit of work being done to educate. Uh, prayer requests for Bless the Nations. Prayer request number one is safety and recovery for Pastor Chen. Uh, since they're ministering in a Muslim, predominantly Muslim area, why uh, the gospel of Jesus is not only radical, it's dangerous. Uh, because of the way Muslims treat any gospel that's alien to their own, uh, their own teachings. Pastor Chan was recently attacked on a train and uh, shortly after that suffered a heart attack. So he's recovering from that. So, so just prayer for s both the safety, continued safety and recovery for Pastor Chan. Uh, blessings also for his work with a replacement pastor because he's seeing, uh, as he gets older, the need to have somebody else to come alongside him. He's training a replacement, so um, prayer for that replacement and his training of that replacement. And then finally, uh, to overcome the COVID-19 travel problem. Steve and Kathy, in the past, have been very faithful at traveling to uh, Pakistan, where Pastor Chand is working, and to helping with uh, the training of people and training of a pastor. Uh, COVID-19 has, uh, as all of you who travel are aware of COVID-19 has made travel real problematic. And in some countries where there's uh, extended stays required, and uh, so it just has made that t quite difficult. Okay, uh, second county we want to talk about is the Dollar Family. Uh, the Dollar Family ministers to the Yawo people of Mozambique. Uh, this is a, an African nation. 
is also under the influence, uh, predominantly under the influence of Muslim teaching. And Stephen, uh, uh, Stephen Kelly had been really long-term, uh, both they and their family have been long-term missionaries in this area because they've found, and I think probably others who minister to Muslims have found, that uh, it does not require a just, uh, here's the gospel, accept it, and you're done. It really requires uh, a long-term presence of Christian people where they can see their lives being lived out. They can see uh, how what the effect of their life is on their children and how their children uh, are blessings and honoring God in, in their own lives. And so... Uh, it isn't the type of thing where you see massive fruit in the terms of uh, the number of people saved, but it is a very foundational work for God in Muslim countries. Uh, community assistance, uh, both for the physical and practical infrastructure needs is part of their ministry. Uh, the slide you don't see shows uh, Steve standing beside a bore well. They actually produce two bore wells and you drill into the ground and do all of the technical things required to, to build a well, a water well. So it's not only a supply of fresh water, but it's also uh, pure, uh, not dangerous, not disease carrying water. And this is a very fundamental need for uh, underdeveloped countries and, and they have uh, been a significant part of developing that. Uh, <laughs> the slide you now don't see shows Sean with a group of uh, the guys that he has a Bible study with. He actually conducts several Bible studies, and this uh, shows Steve with a group of these men who he's teaching. And because of their witness, both their family witness and their presence as an integral part of the community, he's able to do that, even though he's in uh, our Muslim area. Uh, there are dangers, but they seem to have integrated themselves into the community well enough that, that that's not a problem. Very blessed with the Dollar family, uh, Yawo households to come to faith in Jesus. Of course, that's their first one. But they also would like to see godly community leaders who would walk in obedience to the Lord. Uh, in other words, uh, that the whole society, the, the leaders, uh, the people that others look up to would uh, be helpful in their ministry. He says, for the fear of God rather than the fear of man or any other power. And of course, here he's, he is talking about the Muslim influence so that... Uh, those who they're speaking to would have the fear of God rather than the fear of the other things and, and the Muslim influence. And finally, he asked for wisdom and guidance for his team in working with other believers. They've come recently across um, a group of churches that are Portuguese speaking. Uh, and the Portuguese speaking ministry is to different tribes than the Yahweh people. But they're just beginning to have uh, a pulling together of that ministry with with these others, and he would like to see that continue and to grow. So those are those are our mission minute uh, updates this morning, and we just ask anybody who has questions, please let us know, and we'll try to keep you apprised of things that are going on in international missions. Thank you, Dave. It's a truly helpful thing for us to keep tabs on what's happening around the world. Uh, particularly, of course, we're interested with people that you spoke about that, that we know and we're connected to and, and to help. And then we can think that, multiply that by hundreds and thousands of people like that serving around the world uh, as part of God's family. Please join me in our morning prayer. Gracious Lord God, we lift up to you the work, the ministry, the persons of Steve and Kathy and Sean and Deirdre, their families and their co-workers, and uh, boundless numbers of other servants who are out there in the world bringing the good news of Jesus to people in difficult places and difficult settings. And it's a good reminder for us, O oh God, who come to worship in comfort and leisure, 
uh, that life is not like this for many who profess faith in Christ. Father, we pray that you would be at work through them as you promise you are to be building the kingdom of God among us and in us. Gracious God, we lift up to you uh, your church around the world that you'd help us by the power of your spirit to be faithful witness to your good news for all people everywhere. We remember again especially your servants who are persecuted for the work that they are doing. Give them grace and strength to endure and to persevere and help them to know that we're standing behind them Father, we lift up to you uh, our congregation and give you thanks for the opportunities we have to worship and to serve, to learn, to grow, to fellowship, to be your people in this place, to be that spiritual temple that you are shaping and growing. We lift up our pastors, Megan and Tyson, and their family. We give you thanks, O God, for bringing them to us and blessing us with their presence and their leadership, their giftedness. Thank you for calling them, and thank you for calling them to this place. We pray that you'd watch over them, uh, keep them safe, grant them a safe return home, and, and refresh them, O oh God. We lift up to you victims scattered around our community and around the world, and perhaps even in this place today. Victims of violence and tragedy and hunger, Victims of neglect and abuse, Lord God, may they find their peace, their comfort, their wholeness in you. We pray for those who suffer from hunger or disease, from disaster, from life's losses and heartaches, from loneliness. Gracious God, help us to be sensitive to them. And we may encounter these people here among us or out in our community and rub elbows with them and not even know that there's something very difficult in their lives. So help us to live with grace and love, to pay attention, to offer encouraging words, a smiling face, a friendly greeting that can make the difference for people. Lord of God, we lift up to you the leaders of our country, the leaders of this world, the leaders of nations everywhere. For these are troubling and difficult and challenging times, and we are in need of people who can lead with love and kindness and goodness and wisdom, who can lead uh, by giving of themselves to serve others. Gracious God, we pray that you lift up such people. Father, be with us as we continue to worship you this day. We pray that you would uh, be pleased to accept our worship as we worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the first letter of Peter, reading from the second chapter, verses 4 through 10. I forgot to tell Elizabeth when I gave her uh, the text for today that I would be using the New Living Translation. My guess is what you probably uh, have up there is, uh, yeah, what's the right and we regulate? All of a sudden the name is gone. Anyway, you probably have a different translation on the screen, but it should be pretty close. Listen to the words of Peter writing to God's people scattered across a large area. He says, you are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I'm placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. 
Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. May God help us to hear and to understand his word for us today. As we begin, uh, and I, I, I was not aware until yesterday that we had a minute for mission, and so... Uh, I guess this may be seen as a way God is at work, because I want to share with you uh, a brief reading from a book that I use as uh, a devotional, Sunday mornings, as, as part of my uh, quiet time, my time with God. It's called Extreme Devotion. I've mentioned this to you um, some time ago. Maybe it's been a year or more. Extreme Devotion, it's a collection of stories about people who are martyred, or suffer greatly for their faith because of their faithfulness, because of their witness to Jesus Christ in places where that isn't welcomed, um, and they pay a price for it. Uh, this one is, a, is titled Extreme Deal, and it's, uh, it comes, it's a, the setting is in Eastern Europe, and it has to do with prison inmates. The preacher was only making his first point when the prison guards burst into the room, grabbing him and slamming everyone to the floor. You know this preaching is forbidden, one of them growled. Now you will face the punishment. The husky guards dragged him out of the cell and down the hall. The other prisoners knew that the Eastern European communists' guards were taking their friend to the beating room. They heard the door of that terrible room slam and then the muffled shouts and cries as the guards ruthlessly beat their friend. Almost an hour had passed before the guards threw open the cell door and shoved the man who had been preaching in. The other prisoners saw that his clothes were now bloody and his face bore the marks of the beating. He looked around at his cellmates, almost as if taking attendance. Now, my brothers, he said, where did I leave off when we were so rudely interrupted? And the sermon continued. Christians in prison knew the price they would pay to deliver a sermon, and yet many preached. Some with no theological training or ministry experience would preach passionately and eloquently in prison. It was a deal, wrote one prisoner later. We preached and they beat. We were happy preaching and they were happy beating. So everyone was happy. Gracious God, we give you thanks today for the freedom to preach and to hear your word in this place. May the word spoken and heard today faithfully and clearly proclaim the truth of your word to us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the living word. Amen. I'm not sure about you, but I don't get much personal mail these days. I'm talking about a personal letter. You know that somebody sat down and took time to write just to me, addressed to me, a handwritten letter. I get one occasionally from somebody in this congregation, perhaps on special occasions, 
And it's not just a greeting note like, happy birthday signed Bill, but there's a, a small letter always included. And I thoroughly enjoy uh, the effort and the words of encouragement. Well, those days are almost gone, it seems, when we take time to write people. Now, instead of getting some personal letters, we get a flood of impersonal emails, don't we? Sometimes they come to us from a friend or from a group of friends, and we respond, and it's kind of like a letter. But I don't know about you, but I find that when I get a, a letter, if we could call it like that, a message from somebody, it's not quite the same as a handwritten letter for obvious reasons, but even the content seems to be different when we sit down at the computer and send off a quick message to somebody. It oftentimes lacks that story detail, you know, that tells us what's going on and asks us questions and so on. You know what I'm talking about. So in the absence of many of those personal letters, I want to invite us, uh, perhaps even challenge us, to receive Peter's letter to us today as a personal letter, as though he's writing this to you personally, and actually also to us collectively, as he would have when he first penned the letter. It would have been not just to individuals, but to churches, gatherings of God's people. And he's writing a letter to them personally, and I want to suggest he's writing it to us personally, though he had no clue, of course, that you and I would ever read this letter. But it is a letter to you, to me, and to us. Now, if we want to understand what Peter is saying to us today, it will help us to know something about what Peter was writing to them about a long, long time ago. Because he was writing, obviously, in a different, different time in history, a very different culture than what we live in, though there are, of course, similarities that are always present from uh, one period of time to the next because people are largely the same. But he's writing to them for a purpose, and he has a fundamental message that is <coughs> excuse me, woven all through his letter. And uh, I'm going to give you a little summary of what his purpose was, and this just simply comes from the introduction from the uh, NLT, New Living Translation Study Bible, um, and I think it's just a quick, helpful piece. The author there says, First, Peter has the single focus of encouraging Christians to exhibit faithfulness under the pressure arising from persecution. The believers to whom Peter wrote were in the midst of fiery trials. The culture in which they live scorned their faith, criticized their morality, and mocked their hope. Peter calls on readers to respond to this pressure with a renewed commitment to live out the grace of God, both to please God and to bear witness to His grace. Now that kind of pressure wasn't just what we might typically think of when we think of early Christians being persecuted when certain Roman emperors would initiate sort of a state persecution, where the state, the emperor, was after the Christians. But he's talking largely here about the persecution, the criticism, the ridicule, um, the bad behavior that Christians receive from other Roman citizens living in their community who had no appreciation for the truth of the Christian faith. They came from a very different background. The Romans believed and therefore enforced this belief uh, among con peoples they conquered in lots of different gods. And in fact, uh, the Roman emperors probably would see themselves as some kind of a deity as well. So to worship some other god other than some official Roman gods was not a healthy idea and often brought significant consequences. Now as followers of Jesus living in this place where we enjoy such great freedom to come even to a place like this on Sunday morning, for me to stand in front of you and preach, as we call it, and for you to have the freedom to come and listen, is remarkable. And we're inclined to think, well, we don't deal with any of that persecution stuff here in the United States. I want to suggest to you that that's not entirely true, and that perhaps 
Uh, while we don't have any state persecution of religion, for which we should be deeply, deeply grateful, we are experiencing in our culture sort of an unwelcome attitude, at the least, uh, for the Christian faith in certain circles. There are some of our faithful brothers and sisters around this country who are, in fact, facing serious threats, life threats, to themselves and their families via electronic media, whatever. They are being threatened because as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ and their desire to be a faithful witness to Jesus and stand for the things Jesus stands for, they are receiving these threats. And we shouldn't be so surprised that they receive threats. And, and this is just one example. We shouldn't be so surprised that they receive threats from the culture at large. For I think most of us are aware that we are becoming less and less and less what we might think of or want to hope for as some kind of a Christian culture. That people who profess faith in Christ and believe in the God revealed to us in the Bible... Uh, are becoming fewer and fewer. So we should only expect, as Scripture predicts for us, that we would get some kickback from our living out our faith, if we're living it in a vital and real way. right? What is particularly distressing to me is that such threats should come from fellow Christians. Isn't that a sad commentary uh, on the Christian faith? But it happens, it's happening in this country that Christians, Christians are threatening other Christians because of their particular stand on some divisive issues of which there are many, as we know. So in, in sort of an unexpected way, Peter's letter comes to us as sort of a, a freshness, with a freshness, a relevance uh, for us in the church today and, and calls us to ask the question, how is our behavior? You know, what is it that the world is seeing from us that might encourage them to embrace the Christian faith or when they see the worst of it, say, if that's what being a Christian is about, I don't want any part of it. And I'm afraid that that is, happens too frequently. So we too, as uh, the people that Peter was running to that day, we need to be reminded that how we behave out there and among our friends and associates matters. It makes a difference. It matters to God and to his kingdom and the work that God is doing among us and with us. But it also matters to non-believers who are looking at us carefully and trying to decide what this behavior means in terms of being a follower of Jesus Christ. How we behave matters. In fact, Peter begins chapter 2 with these words. He says, so get rid of all evil behavior. Get rid of it. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. And I don't think I need to remind us that there's plenty of that going around, isn't there? Lots of unkind speech, which comes from a place of an unkind heart, an unkind attitude, a place of hatred or uncaring. And Peter says, you've got to get rid of that. It's not becoming of God's people. Put a stop. And then he goes on to remind the readers, sort of a, well, here's why you should get rid of that. You are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Now, frankly, I don't think I, and, and I'm guessing it, perhaps not you, can really grasp the spiritual significance of that. We think, well, that's sort of nice metaphorical language. But I think it's more than that, and I think it goes deeper than that. And, and I'm not quite sure how to get a handle on it, but when, when Scripture says that we are living stones and that God is using us to build a spiritual temple that has a spiritual depth to it 
that is beyond, I think, what catches our attention. And we, we need to be reminded that that is something very significant. Well, when I first read this text, the physical image that came to my mind was the Eckert Presbyterian Church. How many of you have seen the Eckert Presbyterian Church on Highway 65 between, yeah, going up to Grand Mesa? We had our spring presbytery meeting there in May, which I missed because we were out of town. But it's a beautiful stone church, and I took a couple pictures of that recently. Um, this is what a view that you see from the road. You see the bell tower and the entryway. And a second picture that is a little closer up. See the, the stone structure, how all the stones are, uh, are put together, laid together. And if you look close, you'll see that, I think you call it the tuck pointing or the, the mortar in between the stones. Um, and if you were at the building and looked up, you would see that it changes character. Because it was built at different periods of time and it took quite a few years. Obviously, the bottom layer first, lots of mortar, and the tuck pointing's a little bit different than the layer above that, that next, right, right where the windows start. Well, this church was built from a volcanic rock collected from all across the Grand Mesa by members, and you think I'm going to say members of the church. Well, that's true. It was actually a community project. People throughout the Eckert community we're part of this decision. We need a place for people to come to worship. And, and the community gathered stones, probably, this was back in 1913 that it started. The project was interrupted by the Spanish flu and, the, and World War I, and so it picked up again after those events, but people just weren't available, and, it, and then the project was finished. But all of that rock had been gathered from scattered around, and the picture in my mind was like, Peter writing to these Christians and churches scattered across Eastern Asia, where much of which is now Turkey, writing to those, you are living stones, and it's like God is pulling you in from here and pulling you in from there and pulling you in from here and building this living temple, this spiritual temple comprised of us, these living stones. So seeing a... Seeing a building like that is, is a good reminder of, well, the presence of God, Peter is saying, and New Testament tells us, the presence of God is no longer in the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus replaced that temple in Jerusalem, and because of all kinds of things we won't get into now, it's one reason why he spoke pretty harshly about what was going on there. But in A.D. 70, the Romans leveled that temple, in Jerusalem. There wasn't a stone standing on one another, and Jesus had predicted, if you will, that leveling. He said, one day, not one stone that you see in this beautiful temple will stand upon another. And what is God doing instead? Jesus, the cornerstone, we are the living stones. And he's putting it together as a witness, as a testimony as the workforce, if you will, for building and shaping the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And Peter is saying, each of those stones is vitally important. I'm going to just quickly reference that mural that's in the hallway out there. Um, you, can, you can read the story behind it, but you'll also notice that it's like a jigsaw puzzle. And... Uh, Pieces are put together, it's the shape, it, it's to look like this church, and there's always a couple pieces missing. And the saying is, this church is not complete without you, without the next people that come through the door that are not yet part of a church or this church. It's not complete without you, without each one of us being a part. We are that spiritual temple. Well, if we are to be the living spiritual temple that God is building and shaping together, using us, there ought to be something attractive about us, ought there not? People shouldn't be able to look at us and just see some kind of ugly behavior. Just like looking at the Ecker Church is a pleasing, it's architecturally beautiful, it's well-structured, well-designed, and so on, right? 
When I went to, in 1982, I went to the Eckerd Church. It was the first church I served. Uh, we, we moved there in July. By September, I was doing my second wedding. Not from somebody from the church. It was actually a couple from Grand Junction, a young couple, uh, Kelly and, and John. Kelly and John came to, called me one day and said, we're interested in getting married at the Eckerd Church. I've never met them. Let's get together and talk. And one of my first questions, I had a lot of those weddings at Eckerd because of the building. And so I said, well, why do you want to get married here? What is it that, about this place? Kelly said, when I was a young girl, and I want to think she told me five, but the age doesn't matter. She was just a young girl. She was in the car with her parents driving up to the Mesa. And she saw the church, and she says to them, that's where I want to get married. The, the structure, I mean, as a young girl, struck it beautiful. Well, shouldn't there be something appealing about us as the living spiritual temple that makes people say, I want that. I want to be part of that. I like what I see. And, of course, the question always is, well, is what we show people something they would want or desire. She was drawn to the beauty of it. More importantly, it helps to be drawn to the beauty of the people who come inside. The people gathered in these seats. The people sitting in the pews in the Ecker Church or whatever church it may be. That's the beauty that people we want people to be drawn to. And it's nice to have a beautiful structure. I think we have one of the prettiest buildings in town. That's just, I'm a little biased, but I think this is one of the prettiest, most attractive buildings in town. That's a great thing. Far more important is this. And my experience is this is a beautiful thing. You are a beautiful spiritual, living temple of the living God. And he's doing a great work in you and with you and through you. And it is through us then that people can come to see the goodness of God. Now, I don't need to remind us, I said already, that we are living in Difficult, challenging, troubling times. Not just in our country, but you, you look around the world and there seems to be so much turmoil. So many countries. There, there's, I, I don't understand that. I don't grasp But I, I read enough and my, you know, that you, you get a feel for it. You get a glimpse of it. It's just, it's like everywhere. And I think the world is in desperate need of the beauty of God's people. The goodness, the love, the kindness, the generosity, the caring that God's people can bring to the world. A kind word instead of some sharp criticism. A warm smile instead of a growl. Somebody looking to develop relationships rather than trying to find out where the enemy is. What side are they on? How about reaching across the aisle, as we say in certain circles? and welcoming one another, embracing one another. There is, in fact, Jesus teaches us, a better way for us to relate to people than much of what we see going on in our communities, in our world today. And it is sometimes unsettling and troubling, but, friends, it is also an opportunity. It is also an opportunity. And this, perhaps, is a shift of mindset. You know, if, when we moved to Eckert, I was pretty naive. We moved to Eckert, and I, fairly soon after moving there, I said to somebody, or asked people, you know, about what percentage of the people living in the <coughs> area here go to church? What would you guess? And they said, maybe 50%. I was shocked. I came from a community where, where everybody I knew went to church. I, I thought the whole world was like that. You know? But it isn't, is it? Now, as a pastor, I could have said, oh my gosh. 
Or I could say, wow, what an opportunity. And see, I think God's faithful people can look at, at this time and the challenge and we can wring our hands and go, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Or we can say, wow, what an opportunity. What an opportunity to show people the goodness of God through how we live our lives, how we treat one another, how we relate to one another. Quick plug, uh, tie in with David's message. We have, we have a wonderful opportunity that we've actually grasp as a congregation and we aren't quite living into it yet because we're waiting. We're waiting for that Afghan refugee family that we are sponsoring to arrive in town. And by the way, we're getting some word that the process is moving with them. And so we're, we're getting more in, in, I don't know a lot of details about but anyway, we're looking forward to that, that opportunity. What a, what a great opportunity to show them the goodness of God. Why do we do this? Because God is good. Because God has been good to you, and God has been good to me, and God is good to everybody. And he shows no favorites. Wow, what an opportunity for us. And there are, you know, we could go on, 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 and on, list that we and other churches are doing on and on and on about it. The question is always this. Will we be God's living stones with which he can build his spiritual temple. But with that opportunity also comes the opportunity to be stumbling blocks. It's up to us. Depends upon the choices we make. When I was in my early 20s, I came upon a poem in my, I don't remember things very well. Some of you who are newer here know, yeah, he, he can't seem to remember my name. I have to keep asking because I can't seem. But this poem stuck with me, and I'm, I'm glad that it did. I don't remember the, author, the author's name, but I do remember the poem. Isn't it funny that princes and kings and clowns that caper in sawdust strings and common folks like you and me are builders for eternity. Each is given a set of tools, a pair of hands, and a book of rules. And each must make, ere life is flown, a stumbling block or a stepping stone. Let us pray. Gracious Lord God, being your people in the world has never been an easy thing to do. We know of the personal challenges in our own lives. When we want to shape ourselves in the image of Christ, we want you to shape us in the image of Christ, and, and that can be a, an uncomfortable, painful process for us. That somehow, in your wisdom, which sort of escapes us, you choose to use us to show your goodness to the world. Sometimes I think, Lord, there must have been a better way. But this is your way. Make us usable, O oh God, so that others will see in us your goodness, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Time for our offering. Uh, what a privilege and opportunity it is for us to uh, bring some of our resources to do the work in the ministry of God in and among us and in this community and around the world. Some of the things Dave talked to us about today. And so it is one of the greatest privileges we have. Uh, to take the abundance God gives us and to use it and to share it. Gracious God, receive these, our offerings today, for the work of your kingdom, and may it bring you great joy. Amen.
please stand for our final song. chapter of that same letter we were looking at today, Peter writes this. He says, love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. May the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship, the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with you and abide with you, guide you and lead you each and every new day. Amen. <laughs>